so welcome everybody to this workshop today. Um, very pleased. I'm quite excited. I could I lose my words because I'm going to get to this point. I'm so excited. I had words just before I started recording. But um, today's workshop is going to be about doing visualizations with Seaborn, uh, which is a, a bit of a departure for NHSR community. But this is because we've also merged for our conference this year with NHS PyCom. So it's very exciting to see visualizations in a language that maybe some people who come and follow our things don't necessarily use, but would find of interest. And I'm going to pass this over to Parissa to introduce herself and tell us about the workshop and just do the workshop because nobody wants to hear me talking any more about this. I want to see your work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Zoe. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Parisa. Um, I think I'll just start off by sharing my screen, actually. Um, Okay, great. Can I check that everyone can see that? Yes, I can see it. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, welcome to data visualization with Seaborn. Um, so to start off, I think if we could, I'll kind of go through the access to the training environment that we're going to be using for the workshop today. Um, and then I'll kind of introduce the session and introduce myself. But if we'll start off by kind of getting everyone um, onto this training environment. So I'll put this link into the chat as well so it's easy for you to copy and paste. Um, so if you want to head over to this um, link. It will take you to a page that looks like this. And then you just need to type in your email address. Um, and then enter in this password, which is cantaloupe quince. So this training environment will have kind of all the materials and dependencies for the workshop um, already installed. So you don't have to install things yourself. So just to check again, I logged in, but it gave me um, another password for a new password and username. So is there yeah. another bit that I need to click on? Yeah, there's another step. So once you've entered in the password, you can press submit. And then did you get a screen yeah. that looks like this? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a two step process. So um, this then generates the username and password that we're using to log into the actual training environment. Um, so you can then just copy your password. So everyone will have like a different uh, number for their username. And then if you click on this training environment link. Right. OK, thanks. I missed that bit. Um, that's yeah, it will take you to this um, a screen that looks like this. Um, so yeah, then you can just paste in your password there and enter in your username. And click sign in. And then you should have a page that looks like this, but without the projects or you probably won't have a session here as well. And then to launch a session, you just need to create a new session and then Jupyter Notebook and click Start Session. And this will start the session and it will also automatically join you into that session. So then you'll have a Jupyter Notebook page that looks like this. Cool. If anyone is having any trouble getting onto this, uh, please shout and um, we can try and resolve any issues that you're having. Cool. Okay, great. I'll assume um, then that everyone's been successful getting onto here. If you do have any trouble, um, yeah, just say, because we'll be doing exercise exercises from these materials. Brilliant. Thanks, Jake. 
Okay. So while you're maybe kind of going through that still, I'll go through the introductions. If you also want to look at the materials after the workshop, you'll be able to download them from this environment, but they are also on GitHub. And I'll put the link in the chat as well. So yeah, you can also get the materials from GitHub and the slides are on there as well. Okay, brilliant. We can maybe continue then with this introduction. So I'm Parisa and I'm a data scientist and trainer at Jumping Rivers. And I mostly program in Python. So Jumping Rivers is a data science consultancy and we also do training courses um, and yeah, also run conferences. But if you're interested in knowing any more about that, there's some documents on the training environment. Okay, so today's workshop is gonna be on Seaborn. But before we kind of delve into that, I'm just going to give an overview of the general plotting landscape in Python. First of all, maybe if you could put in the chat if you have used Seaborn or Matplotlib before, or any kind of plotting packages you've used in Python before, or none as well is fine. Cool, great. Brilliant, thanks. So kind of a range of things. So there are a lot of packages in for plotting in Python. And at first glance, this is, can kind of seem um, a little bit overwhelming, but we'll kind of um, hopefully go through some of these. Okay, so we have packages that are built on matplotlib, and then we also have packages that are built on um, other languages like JavaScript. So if you've done any plotting with Python before, you've probably come across matplotlib. It is one of the most popular plotting libraries in Python, and it's been around for almost two decades. And it's designed kind of primarily with static 2D plots in mind. Because it's been around for so long, it's got quite a stable plotting interface. And it also has a lot of figure customization options that make it quite flexible to customize figures. And also because it's very popular, it's got an active development community. There are a lot of questions in Stack Overflow. Anything that you want to do in Matplotlib has probably been done before. And it also has comp comp very comprehensive documentation. So it's a really great library to kind of get started with plotting in Python. However, for all its strength, it does have a few downsides. The kind of default appearance, if you've ever used it, the default appearance of plots is not particularly appealing and creating complex figures, especially complex multi-panel plots is not trivial and it requires quite a few lines of code. So what are the alternatives? So in that kind of map of all the packages, we had some Java script related ones. Um, Plotly is a really popular package that's used for interactive visualizations. And Plotly also has an R interface as well. There are some open graphics library related packages as well for Python um, that allow you to render 3D visualizations. And 
um, there's links to all of these packages if you fancy kind of having a, a deeper look. Um, you can get those from the slides. There are also some D3JS packages. Um, Vega Altair is a nice one that allows you to create nice interactive statistical data visualizations. And then we also have all of these packages that are built on top of matplotlib. So plot9 uses the grammar of graphics. So if you've used ggplot before, that might be quite familiar. And then we also have the Seaborn package, which is built on matplotlib, which is what we're going to be focusing, focusing on today. Okay, so what is Seaborn? Seaborn, as I said, builds on top of matplotlib, but it make it integrates a lot nicer with pandas data structures. So it integrates quite closely with those and makes it easier to create plots from a pandas data frame. And you can also create detailed statistical plots with just a few lines of code that in matplotlib would take um, quite a lot of thought and a lot more lines of code. So yeah, it just makes it easy to create nice detailed statistical plots. And also, um, you might be wondering why this person <laughs> is in the slide. And the if anyone's a fan of the West Wing, you might recognize him. So the developers of Seaborn were also fans of the West Wing. And this is Sam Seaborn, who's actually a character yeah, in the West Wing, who the package is, is named after. So one thing um, that is new in Seaborn in version 0.12 is the Seaborn objects interface. We're not actually going to be looking at this today because it's um, still experimental and it's not covered in this um, workshop. But if you're interested in Seaborn and using it in the future, you might want to have a look into this interface because it looks quite interesting and it offers kind of more flexible customization within the Seaborn API. So we'll see as we go on with the course how you can create plots in Seaborn and then customize them using matplotlib and use the two libraries together. With Seaborn objects, the idea is that you don't have to go down to matplotlib. You can do all your customization within the Seaborn API. Um, so yeah, that looks like quite interesting to if you want to look further in the future. Okay, so the plan for the workshop, we're going to start off with an introduction to Seaborn, look at creating some first plots, and then look at how Seaborn and matplotlib can work together. And then in the second part, we're going to look at the different types of statistical visualizations we can create and also creating nice multi-panel plots. Timing wise, this is kind of a rough um, guide to the timings. Um, it's not set in stone, but Essentially, we'll start off with part one and then probably around 11 o'clock have just a 15 minute break um, just to break up the, the workshop a bit and then come back and do part two. And then we'll have a kind of 15 minute buffer at the end um, for any uh, question and answer session as well. But as we're going along, feel free to interrupt me at any point with any questions you have as well. and. Um, either feel free to interrupt me and unmute yourself um, or put questions in the chat. I'm happy to take both. And at the end of the session, I'll show you how to download all the materials from the training environment. And you'll be able to download kind of, we'll go through exercises. You'll be able to download your exercise solutions and any notes that you make in those notebooks, you'll be able to download them. So don't worry about losing that. 
Um, but the materials are also available on the GitHub repo and they'll be up there. Brilliant. Okay, does anyone have any questions so far? If not, then we'll head over back to the training environment. And I will just sort out my window. Okay, so you should have a window that looks like this. And in here we have the materials for this workshop. So um, part one is in this chapter one folder and part two is in this chapter two folder. Um, and I'm going to be doing a live demo um, going through these um, demo scripts and everything that I kind of live code you can find everything that I live code you can find in this demo script in there we also have exercises so you'll get a chance to kind of have a go at using Seaborn yourselves and there are also exercise solutions as well provided. And there's also an exercise backup script. I think this is in case you accidentally delete things in exercises or mess up the exercises script, you will have a backup there as well. Okay, great. So I'm going to go into my tutor scripts. Okay, is this size um, great for everyone as well? Okay, so Seaborn. I've kind of already gone over this, um, but yeah, Seaborn is a Python library that's built on top of Matplotlib and it's designed primarily with data exploration in mind. So first things first, we import Seaborn. And you might be wondering why do we use the alias SNS when we import Seaborn? And that's back to the this character in the West Ring, Samuel Norman Seaborn. So that's why the alias is SNS rather than like SB or something like that. Okay, so we'll start off by looking at some basic plots. Before we can start making plots though, we'll need to load this data. So we're going to look at this iris data set. And if you've done anything with data analysis in Python before, you might be familiar with this data set. It has um, basically yeah, recordings of these dimensions of iris flowers for three different species of iris. So to begin with, we'll look at a basic scatter plot of the petal length versus sepal length. So to do this in Seaborn, just call SNS, and then the function is scatter plot. And to this, we pass a data argument, which um, is the data frame that we want to plot from. So this is iris. And then the data that we want to plot. So on the x-axis, we want to have sepal length. And on the y-axis, we want to have petal length.
And as a side note, in when you're calling this, you have to pass these as named arguments. Um, so Seaborn will complain if, for example, you try and pass Iris as a positional argument. Um, you have to pass it as a named argument. And yeah, this creates a scatter plot then of the sepal length versus petal length. And you'll notice how Seaborn is using the na the column names um, as the axis labels. So we don't have to kind of specify those labels manually as we'd have to do with matplotlib. So with Seaborn, we can also control the formatting of the markers um, using the data from our data frame. So for example, if we wanted to color our markers by the species of iris, we can specify species for the hue argument. So hue controls the color. And if we want to set the style of the markers um, to be determined by the species, we can also pass species to style. Okay, so now we've got the same plot as before, but the color and style of the markers is determined by the species. And Seaborn also takes care of the legend automatically for us, which gives us this nice plot in just a single function call. Okay, so right now we're actually still using the default matplotlib theme, but we can set a theme with Seaborn by running sns.setTheme. And then all the subsequent figures that we plot in our notebook will use Seaborn's default theme. Um, which has a bit nicer styling. And we can also unset this by using sns.reset orig, which will take us back to the original default um, formatting. Brilliant. Does anyone have any questions on scatter plots so far? If not, then we'll go on to line plots. So I'm going to load in another data set. So this time we're going to look at this flights data set. And this has the total number of passengers um, on flights um, over, yeah, per month um, over um, a set of years. So if we want to view this data, we can call the line plot function. And if I wanted to, for example, see how the number of passengers varied um, over time, I will again pass flights to my data parameter. And then I want year on my x-axis. So I'm looking over time. And then I want to look at the number of passengers and how that varies. So. I can put passengers on my y-axis. Okay, so you can see that in addition to the solid line here, we also get this shaded um, error region. And by default, this represents the 95% uh, confidence interval. And we've got this because you can see we have several entries in this data set for year. And so it will, um, the main line here will be the average 
for that year. And then this shaded region is the 95% confidence interval. If we want to remove the error region, we can just include the argument and set CI equal to none. So if I wanted to create the same plot, but without that error band, here I can set CI equals none. And alternatively, I could also um, set CI either as an integer um, to get something other than the 95% confidence interval or as SD to get the standard deviation. So we can also control the line style, color, and et cetera using the data as we did with the scatter plot. Um, so I can create this same plot before. Um, but instead, if I wanted to have, say, a different color line for each month. I can set hue to be months and also style if I want that to be set by the month as well. And now I have a separate line for the number of passengers um, over the years um, for each that were recorded in each month. Um, so yeah, this doesn't look particularly great. This plot is a bit confusing, but um, kind of just goes to show that you can set the the color and style um, by variables in the data as well for a line plot. Okay, great. Does anyone have any questions on anything so far? If not, then we'll go on to the first set of exercises. So you can find these In the, if you go to um, chapter one in the training environment and then go on to exercises. Um, this, there's a set of exercises in here. And for now, I think actually there is only question one. Yeah. So I think I'll give you perhaps 10 minutes to start off with um, to have a go at these exercises. Um, they go through a different data set, um, which is this health, um, this um, yeah, global life expectancy data set um, and go through creating some scatter and line plots um, with this data. But yeah, if you have any questions or get stuck at any point, please feel free to um, ask me um, anything as you go along. So I'll give you 10 minutes um, to have a go at these and then we'll come back at quarter past and go through the solutions.
Hi, Michelle. So you shouldn't need um, to have Python downloaded on your computer. I'll send you a link to this welcome page. Um, so yeah, if you visit this link, you'll just need to type in your email address and this password. Um, so yeah, you'll just need to type in your email address here and then that password counterloop dash quince into this password box here and press submit and that will generate you a username and password. And then if you click on this training environment link, it will take you to another login page where you can log in using this generated password and username. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant. Let me know if you have any trouble logging in. Okay, will do. Oh, yeah. And also the final step will also be um, you'll get to a page that looks like this and you'll just need to create a new session. So you can just create a new session and then select Jupyter Notebook.
okay great um how were those exercises if you maybe want to put in the chat kind of what number um you got up to just to give an idea of how everyone's getting on with those Brilliant. Okay, great. I'll maybe um, whiz through the solutions, but first, was there anything anyone came across that they had questions about? There is a question in the chat from Jake. Oh, uh, sorry. Mediation. I thought. Uh, I think I got confused <laughs> with the Zoom messaging, and I replied directly. Um, oh, but yeah, exactly. Oh no, I wanted to yeah. hear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I asked. I was like, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So the standard deviation would represent yeah the spread spread of the data. Um, so yeah, exactly. Cool. Okay, so I'll go through um, some of the yeah solutions to the exercises. Um, so yeah, first of all, we're setting the theme um, so we can get nice seaborne themed plots. And then this first question is asking you to create a scatter plot showing the life expectancy against um, year on the x-axis. So yeah, this data set has um, data on the life expectancy and also spending health expenditure um, for several countries um, over time. So in this case, we're looking at the life expectancy um, over time for the entire data set. So we can plot this with scatter plot. And then our data, here we've just called it data. So we pass our data set, and then we want to have year on the x axis and life expectancy. Um, so you can kind of already see, like, because as we've got different countries, we already have kind of like different, you can already see kind of different lines um, in this scatter plot. So the next question is asking you to update the color and the shape of the points based on the country. So we can control the color with this hue argument. And the shape um, we can control with this style argument. Um, so yeah, now we can see how the life expectancy in these countries um, varied over time. Then this next part generates a subset of the data for Great Britain. Um, so that's essentially what this mask is doing here. It's filtering the our data set to only include rows where the country is equal to Great Britain. And we can view this by passing gb.head, which by default shows you the first five rows of a data pandas data frame. And we want to use Seaborn to create a scatter plot of the life expectancy in Great Britain against year, and then resize the points based on the annual health expenditure. So again, we call scatter plot. This time we're just passing our GB data, our plot. 
again, we want year on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis. And then we can also, um, so I think I didn't show you this already, but you can use the size argument to vary the point size. And we want the size to reflect the annual health expectancy expenditure, which is recorded in this spending as the column. Um, so yeah, you can kind of now see the life expectancy increase and also the spending um, also increase over time. Okay. And then in this next question, we're going back to using the full data set again um, to create a line plot this time. So now we're looking at line plots to show the average health expenditure over time. So to create a line plot, we use the line plot function. And we're using the data we have here on the x-axis, but this time we were interested in looking at the spending over time. And um, yeah. Okay, because we have um, in our data set, if I look at our data set, Um, because here we have several country, several countries recorded in the country column, we therefore have repeated years in this year column. So here what we're showing is the average spending over the countries recorded in our data over the years. Okay, now rather than averaging over each country, we're going to try and show each country with a different line plot on our graph. And we can do this by setting our hue argument to country, and then each country will be shown as a different color line. So again, we can pass line plot, to use the code we used before. Um, but this time we're going to set the hue to be the country and also the style. Cool. Does anyone have any questions on any of those exercises? You can kind of see that if you had to do this in matplotlib we'll kind of come on to this in a minute um, but it would take a lot more lines of code and you'd have to rather than here the benefit with seaborn is that because it's integrated so closely with pandas we can easily just use variables from our data frame um, to control these different aspects of our of our plot which is really nice Okay, great. So I'll continue on to the next part of, well, yeah, the next section um, of part one. So we're now going to look at Seaborn versus Matplotlib, but the versus here is not really versus, it's kind of how you can use them both together. And we're going to kind of motivate why Seaborn is a good choice for statistical visualizations. So we'll do this with an example. So we're going to try and make a scatter plot with a trend line. This is probably kind of a common thing that you might want to do if you've got a data set and you're just having a go at kind of 
exploring the, the data. Um, so, and if you wanted to explore kind of the relationship between two variables, you might create a scatterplot with a trend line. So to do this in Seaborn, we can simply just call regplot. Um, pass our data, I'm going to use the iris data set and investigate the relationship between the sepal length and the petal length. And so with just this one call to this regplot function, I have a um, graph of the petal length and sepal length and I have a trend line and also I have this shaded confidence interval as well. So if I wanted to make this same plot Um, with matplotlib. Sorry, I've just seen a question in the chat. Um, so this example now, currently I am in, so I'm in this tutor script, but if you want to follow along with this example, I'm in chapter one. And this example I'm looking at now is in this demo script. Um, if you wanted to follow along. Um, but yeah, so I'll, if we wanted to create this same figure with matplotlib, this is the code that we'd have to do it. Um, and you can see that rather than just having a nice simple um, one function call, it's a little bit more involved with matplotlib. So here we're just importing, I'll just kind of talk through um, what's going on here. So we're just importing matplotlib and a kind of common, we're just using a, the pyplot interface here. And I'm also importing NumPy. First of all, we need to calculate the linear relationship between the sepal length and petal length. And then the first thing you notice here is that I have to kind of extract these from the data frame. Um, because matplotlib doesn't really integrate with pandas data frames, I can't just pass the um, variable name on its own, I have to kind of extract it from the data. I then, so matplotlib doesn't have this um, regression functionality, so I have to use another library. So I have to also import NumPy um, to fit a linear model um, to model the relationship between these two variables. And then I have to, um, then here I'm just generating the plot. So this is how you create a scatter plot in matplotlib. Um, and then here I'm plotting the best fit trend line on top. And then we also have to manually set the X label and Y label um, because it can't read them from the data frame. So it's a little bit more involved to do the same thing in matplotlib. And we also don't have the confidence intervals. We'd have to calculate those as well um, and then plot them on top by specifying other lines and the shading in between. So it's a bit more manual. You have to control all these aspects of the plot yourself. Um, whereas in Seaborn, we can just do it with one line. So yeah, we've used a lot more code and we don't even have the confidence interval. Um, so yeah, essentially there are kind of a few drawbacks with matplotlib 
um, there's no regression functionality, so we have to calculate the linear model separately. Um, and yeah, we had to kind of add the data points and the best fit trend line in separate function calls. And we have to yeah specify the axis labels manually. So why use matplotlib at all? So if you want, if all you want to do is kind of create a quick statistical plot to visualize your data, it's probably best to use Seaborn. However, Seaborn actually um, wraps around matplotlib. So here, the regplot function is actually just a wrapper around a lot of matplotlib um, functions to kind of generate this um, visualization. So because Seaborn actually wraps around matplotlib, you could use these libraries together. And essentially the way you can work is use um, Seaborn to create your visualization. And then if you wanted to use it in a publication and you want to kind of edit formatting of the plot, etc., you can use matplotlib then to edit the formatting and styling um, of your plot and kind of tweak it and customize it. Yep, so we can initialize the figure using matplotlib, then modify onto that figure using Seaborn. So I'll kind of give an example of maybe a workflow that you could use to use Seaborn and matplotlib together. So I'll first of all just set the style. So we use how you set the style in Seaborn in matplotlib, you can set the style with this plt.style.use function. If you want to see what styles are available, you can use plt.style.available and that will give you a list of these um, sort of, yeah, already available style sheets. Um, but yeah, we can just use this one. There's a Seaborn one in matplotlib. Oh, yeah. Use, use it. Okay, so we're going to then reproduce our regression plot, but use a combination of matplotlib's object-oriented interface and Seaborn's regplot function. So has anyone used matplots? Matplotlib's object-oriented interface before. If you just want to put a yes or no in the chat, that'd be great. Cool. So I'll just do um, a quick overview. So essentially, Matplotlib has a couple of interfaces. The one that you might be more familiar with is this um, PyPlot interface. And then calls like I did there with plt.plot to create a figure. So here, when I created this Matplotlib, matplotlib figure, I was using the PyPlot interface. I just call scatter and plot. And essentially, because these are in the same cell in this notebook, um, it knows that this plot, this line is added onto the same plot as scatter. Um, however, if you go outside of a notebook um, and maybe you're generating several plots in the same Python script or something, um, you can use matplotlib's object-oriented interface, makes it easier to kind of keep track of where your plot is going, what figure you're plotting onto. Um, so to create a plot with the object-oriented interface, you first create an instance of a figure class. 
Um, so yeah, I've already got that there. So this is a figure object that we can then um, plot onto. Once you've initialized a figure, you then need to add a set of axes to that figure. And if you want to create a set of axes that occupies the entire figure, you can use this shorthand. So this plt.subplots will both create the fig um, object and also the axis object onto the figure. So now we've got a figure with the with one set of axes. Okay, so now kind of back to our example, if we wanted to add our regression plot onto this axis, um, we can first call, we first initiate our figure and our axes. And then we call reg plot, as we did before. So I pass it the iris data, um, the sepal length. The petal length. And then I can also specify an axis argument, so AX. And here I specify kind of what axis object I where I want my figure to be. So this is going to put it onto the axis that I created up here. The benefit of this is then I can manipulate parts of this figure using matplotlib. So for example, to set, if I wanted to change the X label, so here by default, it's using the name of the pandas column, but pandas columns are usually designed to kind of, you know, have this snake case variable names, which don't look very nice if you want to put a figure in a report. So if I want to go and change the axis label, I can do that with matplotlib by using the set X label method. And I can also change the Y label, Y label method. And this looks a bit nicer if I wanted to put this in a report. So the benefit of using Seaborn and Matplotlib together is that I don't have to, you know, have all that long block of code to create my reg plot, but I can still kind of have this flexibility where I can go and change things like the axis labels. Okay, so this example kind of motivates a workflow that you could use when working with Seaborn. Um, you can set a style. So first of all, we set a style using matplotlib. We can then initialize a figure using matplotlib's object-oriented interface. We then insert our statistical visualization onto that axis. And then we can uh, customize our figure using matplotlib. And in the subsequent plots that we make in the next part, we'll kind of use this workflow where we'll create this um, axe figure and axes and then plot onto the axes. Does anyone have any questions on this? If you've not seen the object oriented interface before, it could take a little while of getting used to, but essentially rather than just um, plotting with PyPlot and hoping that your figures end up where you want them to be, you kind of specify exactly 
where you're where you're putting stuff. So when you um, uh, sort of specify fig and axe, how does it then know to continue to use them? Is this sort of built into the? So in in the example, you, you specify fig and axe, and then you do the SS, SNS dot reg plot, um, and then axe dot set x label. Um, but you did, so you don't, you don't use fig again. How does it sort of know to continue to use that? If that makes sense. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah. So Axe is actually um, this Axes object. So here I can call this anything. I can call it like AX1 if I wanted. Um, so yeah, here basically I'm creating a variable called AX1. Mm -hmm. It is a a matplotlib axes object. Yeah. And then that axes object has certain methods. Um, so it has this set x label method. And it has this set y label method to change like the um, x label and y label of that okay. axes. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but essentially yeah, I think it's like that, the yeah. same as like creating a variable and then calling methods on that. Yeah. How, how does, um, how does like fig link to it? Is it, is axe a method of the fig or yeah. Um, so I think if you want to. Yeah, so there's a different way. So I think you can do, I think it's fig.addaxes okay. um, will, yeah. So I could do, do something like fig.addaxes. Um, to add an axis onto that figure. Mm. Um, but essentially, this when you do it like this, you have to like specify um, dimensions of the axes on the figure. Okay. Um, and that's kind of annoying to do. So I could do something like that. Um, but then, oh, maybe that won't show. Um, but yeah, I could do something like this. And it's just more complicated. It's just a bit more complicated. Whereas this shorthand yeah. kind of just like will do it for you. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of so the same as calling fig and then ax equals fig dot add axes. Okay, yeah. No, no, it's so is, is it ax one here that kind of stores that has the figure? inside it a bit like that variable yeah okay okay that makes sense cool yeah and there's loads of other methods that you can use as well to kind of manipulate um properties of the axes cool thank you cool Okay, so that is the end of part one. I think so. Yeah, part one is slightly shorter than part two. Um, so finished a little bit early, but I think we can maybe, this might be a good point to take a 15 minute break and then we can come back and do go through chapter two. So in chapter two, we'll go through some more kind of different types of plots. So we'll look at scatter plots again, um, but with this 
um, yeah, with this um, object-oriented matplotlib kind of framing. And we'll look at creating like histograms, kernel de density estimation plots, um, categorical, so plots for categorical data, and then also looking at um, multi-panel plots. So including, yeah, facet grids and pair grids. So they're really nice if you want to, if you've got a large data set and you want to visualize the relationships between all the different variables in that data set, um, creating a pair grid is a really nice and easy way to do that. And it's really easy in, in Seaborn compared to Matplotlib. Um, but yeah, so we'll take a break now and then come back at 11 o'clock and go through the second part, if that sounds good to everyone. No worries, Michelle. Thanks very much for coming. I can pause the recording while we have a break as well, if you'd like. Cool. Yeah, yeah that sounds good. Cool. Uh, I feel like that message always like surprises me. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you're back from the break as well, if you could maybe put back in the chat just to check everyone's um, back. And we'll continue, brilliant, we'll continue with advanced statistics with Seaborn. Um, great, and yeah, I'm still sharing, brilliant. Okay, so we've looked at kind of some basic scatter and line plots with Seaborn and also how we can use Seaborn and Matplotlib together to easily create and customize statistical visualizations. So in this next section, we're going to explore a range of the data visualization um, options that are available in Seaborn. So we'll look at um, investigating bivariate relationships, distributions, and also categorical figures. And we'll finish this chapter by seeing multi-panel plots um, and looking at facet and pair grids. And we're going to, throughout this, um, part of the workshop, we're going to continue initializing our figures um, with this figure in axes objects with matplotlib and then passing that axes object to Seaborn with the AX argument that we saw previously. Um, and I will just switch over to this tutor script. Okay, so we'll start by looking at bivariate relationships. So this is two variables plotted against each other. And we'll revisit uh, scatter plots. So I'm going to load this penguins data set. And this is quite similar to the iris data set, but for penguins, it's different um, dimensions of penguins and also the, their body mass um, for three different species of penguins. Okay, so we'll first visualize the bill length versus flipper length as a scatter plot. So um, I need to import matplotlib as well um, because we're going to be using that to initialize our figure. And I'll first of all initialize the figure. And when you call this um, plt.subplot, you can also pass an argument for the fig size. 
um, to allow you to yeah control the size of your figure as well. Okay, then onto this figure, I'm going to put a scatter plot with Seaborn. So I call scatter plot the same as I did before. This time, my data is the penguins data set. And I'm going to plot the flipper length against the bill length. Okay, and I can also control the color. Um, so I'll have a different color for each species of penguin and also, um, yeah. And then I will specify that a this axis. So I'm putting it onto this matplotlib initialized figure. Okay, so this is kind of similar to what we did before. The only different bit is this time we're initializing the figure with matplotlib and then specifying this axis argument. So here we've colored the data points according to species, um, but as we saw before, we can map up to three variables using the parameters hue, size, and style. So I'll just recreate a similar figure. Um, so here I've set the color. Uh, yeah, I've mapped the color to the species. I could map the size to the body mass of the penguins. And I could map the style of the points to the island. So this penguins data set um, also has an island column um, and this body mass column as well. Okay, so yeah, now I've got several variables mapped onto several different aspects of this plot. And this is probably a bit too many things um, to map at once. Um, but yeah, essentially it gives an idea of what you can do. And so the point style is based on island, which is a categorical variable, and the point size is based on body mass, which is a numerical variable. The coloring right now is... Um, the default for a categorical variable, but we could also color our points by a numerical variable. So for example, we could actually color our points by the body mass if we wanted to. Um, so I'll just again, code. So if we map a numerical variable onto the color, we'll get a sequential color, color gradient. And there are a range of different color palettes to choose from. Um, so we can also um, select which color palette we want to use for this color map as well. Um, so if I same plot. The color map can be controlled with this palette argument. And a common palette that's used is Viridis. Have I just spelled palette wrong there? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can control uh, the color map that we want to use for our plots as well. And um, yeah, Juan, you can um, yeah change the size of the points as well with the size argument. So here I could also reflect size. Oh, 
reflect the body mass with the size of the points. Yeah, I think generally it's nice to have kind of these mapped to the same variable. I think if you have too many aspects of the points mapped to different variables, it gets a bit um, confusing, but yeah. Ooh. Okay, does anyone have any more, have any questions on that so far? If not, then we'll move on to optimization functions. So we've already briefly looked at this regplot function for generating regression fits. So for example, looking at my penguins data, I might want to look at the relationship again between flipper length and um, body mass. Okay, and um, this then displays um, by default a linear fit between these two variables with a 95% confidence interval. It's also possible to apply a polynomial fit um, with this with a order parameter. Um, so I can pass an extra parameter order, and if I set that to two, then that will be uh, order two polynomial. So one way of assessing the goodness of fit is by looking at the residuals. So that is the difference between um, these data points and the best fit line. And we can visualize those using the resid plot function. So essentially the way that we yeah, use the resid plot function is we pass all the same things that we would to our reg plot. Um, but to resid plot. So again, the data um, and the variables that we're looking at. The order of the polynomial the fit and then here we see a plot of the um, residuals so yeah the difference between our fit trend line and the actual data points So there's a lot more to Seaborn's regression functionality that we won't go into in this workshop, but if you're interested, um, this link is in the demo notebook as well, um, where you can find out more about, yeah, the regression functionality in Seaborn. Ooh. Okay, so we'll go on to then the first set of exercises for this part. So just a reminder as well, if you go, we're now in chapter two. So if you go into chapter two, 
and then click on two exercises. This will contain all the exercises for this chapter. And for now, we're just doing um, question one of the exercises. So I think I'll give you five minutes to have a go at question one. So yeah, it's just question one A, which is essentially just asking you to run some code. And then question one B asks you to add a residual plot onto, onto a plot. One thing I will just note here is that I'll go ahead and run this. Um, so before when we've called subplots, we haven't, um, we've just had the axis span the entire plot. When you call subplots, you can also have a multi-panel plot and you can control that with this n rows and n calls arguments. So here we're, we've got two rows of plots. When you have multiple plots, this AX variable is actually now an array of two axis objects. So AX naught will control the top axes and AX one will control the bottom axes. So in this code, we're adding a reg plot to AX one, AX naught, so the top plot. Um, so here we pass AX naught to our axes argument in our reg plot. So essentially, whatever you pass to this AX parameter here will control like where on the figure you want your, your plot to go. Um, so yeah, if you want to plot onto the top one, you pass AX naught. And if you want to plot onto the bottom one, you pass AX one, etc. Um, cool. So I'll give you, yeah, five minutes to have a go at running through that, and then we'll look through the solutions at um, 11.26. Sorry, I meant 11, 21, not 26. Yeah, <laughs> my minutes.
Okay. Um, how is everyone getting on with that question? Does anyone have any um, have any problems with it or have any questions before I go through the solutions? Um, I'll go through the solution then for that one. So, yeah, again, we're using health expenditure data filtering for Great Britain, and then kind of went through this part where we're creating our um, figure and axes. And then in this question 1B, um, the code here adds a regression plot to the upper panel to yeah, show the best of a trend line for life expectancy versus the health expenditure. And if we want to add a residual plot onto the lower panel, we can do that with sns.residplot. And again, we pass these same parameters. Um, yep, the same X and Y parameters and the same data. So I'll just copy that in there. And then we want to have this on the lower plot. So here, pass AX1 for our axes. So that will put it onto this lower plot here. So yeah, just an aside as well, if you had to go at this, we can, because our figure was created with matplotlib, we can customize it using matplotlib syntax. So here we have life expectancy um, on the y-axis, but instead what we could do is change that with this set y label. And what we can also do is when we call subplots, if we want, like, I guess here, the spending is the same on like these two plots kind of share the x-axis. So subplots also has a parameter share x. Um, and then these will share that x-axis. And there are like other parameters in here as well that you can change, like I think, but yeah, height ratios. Um, yeah, if you wanted that to be the main plot and then like a smaller residual plot. Um, that's quite nice. Cool. Okay, does anyone have any um, questions on that exercise? Cool. Yeah, I do like this share X. Um, and you can do the same with share Y as well if you've got a grid. Um, but yeah, this is kind of actually going back to matplotlib kind of customization. Cool. Okay, so we'll continue with looking at distributions. So yeah, it's often useful to visualize the model and the spread of data or the yeah, spread of a particular variable of interest. So we're going to look at histograms and stay with this penguins data set. So the function in Seaborn for creating a histogram is histplot. And again, all of the Seaborn functions have the same the parameters. So you pass the data 
and then here we just have one we, here we just have an x variable um oh and then okay so yeah this is how we can create a histogram with seaborn Additionally, you can change the number of bins with the bin width. Oh, yeah, you can change the number of bins with the bins parameter, or you can specify a bin width with this bin width parameter. So I could change the number of bins to be bin, for example. And as with scatter plots, we can also use the hue to split the histogram by some variable. So if I have take this same plot, I might want to split by species. So have a separate histogram for each species. Um, so yeah, now I can kind of visualize the distribution of the body mass for these three different species on the same plot, which is quite nice. Although when the bars are plot like this, it's quite hard to see because um, they're overlapping. So you can also use a stepped histogram to improve the readability. Um, so yeah, I can take the same code as I had before and add this element parameter and set that equal to step. And now this is just a bit easier to read. Um, Okay, so that's looking at histograms. We can also um, create kernel density estimation plots with Seaborn. And these are used to obtain yeah, a continuous estimate of a distribution by smoothing the histogram. And by default in Seaborn, it will use a Gaussian kernel to smooth this histogram. And we can create kernel density estimation plots by using this KDE plot function. And again, if you were to do this in matplotlib, you'd have to kind of do like program that all yourself, like or use an external library. So it's quite nice that the plotting and this density estimation and stuff is all contained within the Seaborn library. Um, so yeah, we'll again look at the body mass and we'll split by species again as well. Um, so then this gives this um, kernel density estimation plot. And the granularity of the estimated density is controlled by um, the bandwidth of the Gaussian kernel. So that's kind of like the yeah standard deviation. Um, but yeah, you can imagine that's the bandwidth of your Gaussian. Um, and you can control that with this bandwidth adjust parameter. So if I set this, um, oh. My mouse is disconnected. Um, yeah, so you can kind of um, tune the bandwidth parameter. Well, so if I set this too small, then I'm going to be yeah, kind of get too many fluctuations. If I get set this too large, um, I might be smoothing over features like um, yeah, smooth over smoothing the distribution. Um, 
I think by default it's set to one as well. So the, oh yeah, my mouse is back, great. So the KD calculation assumes that the data is continuous and unbounded, but for example, if it would be unrealistic for you to have values below zero, um, you can also set a cut when calling KDE plot. Um, so here I could also set a cut equal zero. Um, yeah, if you wanted to. Okay. So it's also possible to plot a histogram and a KD plot together by setting KD equals true when you call histplot. So if I take my histogram that I used earlier, so right now this is plotting a histogram of the body mass for these different species of penguins. If I wanted to overlay a KDE plot on top, I can just set um, KDE equals true here. And that will then overlay, give me a histogram with the KDE estimation overlaid, which is really nice. Okay, so that was looking at yeah, univariate distributions. We can also look at bivariate distributions where we plot a two-dimensional distributions of a pair of variables. Um, so yeah, this is a good way to visualize the spread of data um, and also see the correlation between, between variables. So, to do this, we again use histplot. And I'm going to again use the penguins data set. And so before we just had X as body mass. And to do a bivariate distribution, we just simply also specify a Y variable. Okay, so we can see that these two variables are correlated and here the darker shade um, represents the higher density and the lighter shade is a lower density. And you can also add a color bar onto the um, plot as well by just setting this color bar parameter to true. So this gives me then a color bar as well on my plot, which is nice. And again, you can vary the size of the bins using the bin width argument. Um, so yeah, I could here specify change yep, the size of my bins. And we can do the same with a KD plot as well. So we can also plot a 2D um, distribution um, with a KDE plot. So to do that again, it's the same as a HIST plot. 
um yeah don't specify the plot so yeah for a two-dimensional kd plot it's the same um along with specifying an x variable we also add a y variable and then we'll get a bivariate distribution so each of these contours um, is a isoproportion of the density so basically it traces um, a line of constant density and these levels so each of these um, lines is a level that's chosen so that the mass outside this contour is a particular fraction of the total mass and by mass we just mean like the integral of the density so the we can hear I it's chosen some default levels but you can also specify the levels um, explicitly by using this levels argument. So if I plot the same, um, I can specify a levels argument So this outer, um, yeah, so the outermost one here would be the line, yeah, the contour where 1% um, of the, yeah, the mass outside the contour would be 1% of the total. And then this one would be 10%, 50%, and then 5%. Sorry, 95%. So yeah, I really, I like these um, bivariate histograms are really nice to kind of look at the correlation, yeah, between, between data points. And yeah, some nice plots as well that I'm not gonna actually show you these in the course, but um, there, I think I'll look up actually, if you can do this with Seaborn, but a nice plot that you can create as well with this type of 2D histogram is you can imagine this plot here. And if you had a subplot on one axis with just the 1D distribution and a, another subplot on along the bottom with like the 1D distribution of body mass. Um, so you can see like how the 2D distribution and also the 1D distributions of each of those variables kind of on the same plot. I really like that kind of plot. Um, but yeah, we show in the like full course, yeah, we show like how to do that in matplotlib. Um, but yeah, I'll have a check and see if that's possible in Seaborn as well. Cool. So we'll then go on to question two of the exercises. So in this question, we're looking at a data set which has, um, yeah, pulse rates for different types of exercise and diet. Um, so the type of exercise is recorded in this kind column um, and Um, okay. 
Um, so yeah, it has rest, walking and running. So those different types of exercise. Um, so yeah, this is just asking you to plot some histograms um, with this data set. So I think maybe I'll give you eight minutes to have a go at these exercises. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or get stuck anything on anything, then just shout.
Hi everyone. So it's eleven fifty. So I'll go through the solutions for those question two exercises. Did anyone have any questions or get stuck on anything? Cool. Um, I'll just um, whiz through the solutions then. So, yeah, we're looking at this exercise data set. And the first question is asking you to plot the distribution of pulse rates. So, we're going to do this. using Seaborn and Matplotlib together. Um, so yeah, I start off by initializing my figure and axes. And then I can call his plot. exercise data and I want to plot the pulse rate which is in this pulse um, oh yeah and also I could if I wanted to have the seaborne theme Um, or I can use plt.style.use as well and set a theme that way. Um, the next part of the question asks you to plot the distribution of pulse rates again, but this time split by exercise type. So we saw how you can use the hue argument to split by a variable in your data set. And the exercise type is listed in this kind column. We're going to split our histogram by kind. And then the final part, we're recreating this plot, but this time using a um, KDE. Um, so we just need to change to KDE plot. Cool. And as an aside as well, um, there is a way in Seaborn of creating this um, plot where you have the bivariate distribution and then also the univariate distributions as side plots. And you can do that with this, it's called a joint plot. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if I do the penguins data again, um, and then have the length. All that. This will give me a um, scatter plot as my main plot. And then um, these, um, oh yeah, so sorry, it's not the, it's not a bivariate distribution there. It's a, yeah, a scatter plot. And then it will give me a histogram on the side axes. And then you can also do, um, Something like kind equals KDE as well. And then if I wanted to also split by the different species. 
Oops. Um, Q equals species. Um, so yeah, then I'll get the KD. Or maybe I can do kind equals. Mm. Oh yeah, okay. So that's a bit weird with the <laughs> different colors, but yeah, essentially it looks a bit nicer if you do KD, I think. So this is how you would kind of create this sort of plot in, in Seaborn. Um, which, yeah, if you, we do have a, yeah, I've taught like matplotlib workshops and courses and stuff before where you can do this in matplotlib and it it takes a lot, um, a lot more lines of code and a lot more kind of in-depth um, kind of manipulation of things to to create this plot. So it's so nice that you can do it in, in one function with Seaborn. And often as well, when you're kind of, you just want to um, kind of experiment and um, yeah, kind of explore the data. You don't want to spend ages kind of manipulating plots. You just kind of want a quick, quick way to view the data. So Seaborn is really good for that. Cool, does anyone have any questions before we move on to categorical data? Okay, cool. So we've previously visualized categorical variables using colors, shapes, and sizes. Um, but here we're going to look at some plots that are specifically for visualizing categorical data. So one of these is a swarm plot. This is kind of just to give an overview of some other different plots that you can use in Seaborn. So for example, you can create a swarm plot. Um, so yeah, create a scatter visualization of flipper length um, for each of these different species. So in a swarm plot, the data points are shifted horizontally, so there's no overlap. So it kind of just, yeah, gives an idea of the distribution for the data in each category. If you want to look at the spread of points, you can use a box plot. And um, again, the function for that is box plot. And yeah, again, so X is a species. So that now on the X axis, we're putting a categorical um, variable um, with yeah, a numerical variable on the Y axis. And then we can also again, split by Q. Um, so have a box plot for the different um, sex of penguins. Um, so yeah, so with the box plot, the middle horizontal line is the median of the distribution. And then this will be the, um, this shows the interquartile range, and then this will show the full range of the data and then outliers are marked as well. And then the final one we'll look at here is a bar plot. So we'll look at that for this flights data set. And so, yeah, this data set shows the number of passengers each month over a 12 year period. If we wanted to create a bar plot showing the number of passengers each month, we can do that with this bar plot, bar plot function. Well, cool. thanks very much, Juan. Um, and the, yeah, so then we've got the number of passengers for each month 
because this is averaging now over the years in the data set, we've got this um, error bar here, which shows um, the variation around the mean. And the height of the bar plot is the, the mean for each year in that month. Sorry, yeah, the mean like over the years. Um, so yeah, this is kind of just an overview of some of the categorical um, plots that you can use in Seaborn and there's a lot more as well to choose from. Um, the Seaborn documentation is pretty good. Um, and most of these plots as well have the same syntax. So they all take a data set and they all will take an X and Y variables or just an X variable if it's a univariate distribution. And then they will take, you know, a hue um, argument as well. So they kind of have the same nice um, uniform syntax. Yeah, so after a while, it kind of feels quite intuitive. You're just going through different types of plots. Cool. Does anyone have any questions on categorical plots? Cool. Okay. Um, then we will go on to the final section, which is looking at multi-panel plots. So yeah, this is just kind of what I said before. Um, we've covered a lot of plots, but they all have the same kind of uniform syntax. So the first type of multi-panel plot we're going to look at is facet grids. And these are used to construct multiple plots that use a um, yeah, subset of the data set split on values of variables. So before we kind of were splitting over a variable with by showing them in different colors. So for example, so yeah, here um, we were splitting over the species variable. Here they're shown all on the same plot. We might want a multi-panel plot that had these each on separate plots, or we might have kind of we might want to look at the distribution split over multiple category, multiple um, categorical variables. Um, so we can do that with a facet grid. Apologies for all this scrolling. Okay, so we'll start off by looking at, um, yeah, taking that distribution of penguin body mass from earlier and create multiple panels. So this time we're going to split over the sex variable and also the species variable. So the way that we create these multi-panel plots is we first of all create a um, facet grid object, which kind of just creates the grid of plots that we're going to then, um, like the grid of figures that we're then going to draw our plots onto. Um, so yeah, the way we create a facet grid is with this, um, yeah, facet grid function. Again, the data is penguins. Then we pass a row parameter um, for, and here we specify the variable that we want to um, split by um, over the rows. So each row in our grid is going to be a different um, sex, so male and female. And then each column in our grid is going to be a different species. So it's like Adeli, Gen 2, and another species of penguin that I've forgotten, um, Chinstrap. 
So yeah, here we've made two rows for male and female and then three columns for Delhi, Chinstrap and Gentoo. Next, we're going to map some plots onto these, um, onto this grid of figures. And so we map plots onto our panels with this map method. So essentially, we're going to take the same thing as before. So we create our grid. And then with map, we specify, OK, what is the actual plot that we want to show? So the first input of map will be the name of the plotting function that we want to use. So if we want a his plot, then that will be sns.hisplot. Subsequent arguments will be the arguments that we would usually pass to histplot if we were just calling it normally. So we specify the variable that we want on the x-axis. And then histplot also had this element variable, um, element um, argument. So here we could then put any other arguments that we would usually pass to histplot. Okay, so then this has created our facet grid. So it's created a histogram um, where in the, yeah, so it's created histograms. Um, so in this kind of top left, we've got a histogram for just the male Adeli penguins, just the male chinstrap penguins, male genti penguins, and then the same for the female. So yeah, when um, this co-chunk actually, yeah, you can see there's all these warnings about um, a yeah, it's just a deprecation warning. Um, that's in the Seaborn package that we're using, the particular version that we're using right now. So if you want to disable those warnings so they don't come up, you can just run this cell. And then, um, yeah, that will get rid of all those warnings appearing. Okay, so there we had a grid with both columns, multiple columns and multiple rows, but we don't have to um, do that every time. We could just use a single column. Um, so we could instead have sns.facet grid. As we had before, so penguins, and then we're gonna have um, just, we're not going to have a column this time, we'll just have a row and we'll map sex onto the rows. So the rows will be split by sex and then instead of splitting the species by columns, we could use the hue parameter to split the species. And then, um, yeah, so I'm going to use the hue parameter here to split species. Um, so, yeah, if we've kind of got two categorical variables that we want to split by, we could put one onto, we could use one with the facet grid, and then one could be indicated with different colors. Um, this might be easier to compare than kind of having them each on a separate plot. Um, and yeah, we can also use dot add 
legend here to add a legend to our plot um, for these different colors. Okay. The next type of, um, well, the final type of multi-panel plot that we're going to look at are pair grids. So these will be used to show the relationship between every combination of two parameters in your data set. So this is really useful to just quickly kind of get an idea of the correlation between variables. Um, so again, we start off by creating our kind of grid. Um, but this time it's going to be a pair grid instead of a facet grid. And again, um, going to use our penguins data. Okay, so you can see um, this has created now a grid where we have every variable. Um, so we have a row, a column for every variable and also a row for every variable. So on the diagonal, we're actually plotting a variable against itself. So we have this, um, we start off by creating that pair grid. And I'm just going to split this onto several lines just to make it um, look a bit nicer. So start off by creating our grid. Then we need to say what we want to put on each of these um, on each of these plots. So if we we can use um, the map diag to fill the di what plot should go on the diagonal of this grid, and then map upper to say what we want to put on the upper um, yeah upper half, and then lower to say what we want to put on this lower section. Um, yeah, below the diagonal. And yeah, we can also um, map the off diagonal and also just use dot map to put the same thing everywhere if we wanted to. Um, but for now, we're going to use map diag, map upper, map lower. So, I'm going to put a KDE plot on the lower part. And again, like we did with the facet grid, we just here specify the, yep, so the first argument to map lower will just be the um, name of the Seaborn function that we want to use um, in that, in the lower part of our grid. So sns.kde plot. And on the upper part, I can put a histogram, so histoplot. And then on the diagonal, I'm also going to put a KDE plot. Um, so yeah, we can also, so yeah, here we see now we've got the KDE plots here, the bivariate hist plots, and then where we're mapping a variable against itself, Seaborn automatically will plot actually the one dimensional distribution of that variable along the diagonal, which is quite nice to see. What you can do is because here 
the scale, yeah, this plot doesn't show up with the scale that we have on our y-axis. What you can do is specify an extra argument in here. Um, so when we call pair grid, we can specify whether we want the diagonal to share this scale on the y-axis. And if we set this to false, Wait, wait a while for all the plotting to happen. Um, then now the axis won't be shared with the other panels. So the um, plot on the diagonal will take up the full height of the vertical axis. So you can actually kind of see this a bit better. Um, okay. And oh yeah, I could also put a scatter plot if I wanted to. Um, Yeah, this does take a while to plot. Cool. And again, like we did for the pair grid, I can also specify a hue argument if I wanted to also split these um, plots by species again. Um, so yeah, this is a really nice, easy way of visualizing kind of all the relationships between all the variables in your data. And it's so easy to do this in Seaborn compared to, to Matplotlib. It's really nice. Cool. And um, yeah, the final um, thing I'll show you here is that sometimes you might only want to show a single type of plot, so you don't necessarily need this upper diagonal. Um, oh yeah, this upper part. So you can do that by creating a corner plot by setting corner equals true. So if I have the same plot as before, Um, and here I can set corner equals true, and then it won't create that um, those upper plots. Um, so yeah, if you didn't want a scatter and the KDE plot, you just wanted to show a single type of plot, then you can use the corner plot. Does anyone have any questions um, on these multi-panel figures? If not, then I'll go on to the final section, which is just on how to customize these multi-panel figures. So the customization of facet grid and pair grid is slightly more complicated. You can't pass um, a matplotlib axes when you're creating these plots, unlike the functions that we saw earlier. Um, because, yeah, they are, facet grid and pair grid are already initializing a matplotlib figure internally. Um, but you can access the figure and axes objects that have been created internally and then use those to edit things about your plot. So the way you would customize multi-panel figures is I will create a facet grid here. Um, 
Um, yeah, this is kind of the same one I had before, where sex on the rows and species on the columns. And then I'm going to map a hist plot of the body mass. Okay, so this is the plot that we had before. Um, if I want to, for example, edit the x-axis labels so that they're not the same as the, so they have like a bit of nicer formatting, um, I can access the figure and axis objects that were created internally by Seaborn. By calling g dot figure and g dot axes. So if I do if I do g, g dot axes, um, this dot shape. Um, I can see this is a two by three array um, of axes objects. So similar to what we were doing before, now there's a, each of these is a different axes object. Um, so I'm kind of doing the same thing I did before, but rather than um, creating the figure and axes with matplotlib, calling Seaborn, and then manipulating things here, the Seaborn function is already creating that figure in axis, so you don't have to do it yourself. So here I'm just accessing the ones that were created by in this Seaborn function. Okay, so then if I wanted to change a axis label, say in the um, so say I wanted to change the axis label for this particular plot, I would access that with one zero. So if I do um, g dot axes, this axes object. So AX10 is the axis object in this position. And then I can call dot set label like a X label like I did before and change that. So here I've ch um, changed that axis label. If I want to do it for each of these, I can um, do that in a loop is probably the easiest way. So I'm going to loop through these axes objects in these three positions and change their um, X label. So for I in range three, So I want to, the first index is the row and I want to stay on row one. So the indexing in Python starts from zero, um, but I'm going to loop through this column index and set the um, X label for each of those columns. And an additional thing, if I want to also save this figure, and do that with matplotlib. So fig dot save fig. And 
And then if I go to my tutor scripts, chapter two, I've got this penguins figure there. Cool. So yeah, you can still with um, multi-panel plots in Seaborn, you still have access to the sort of internal matplotlib objects and you can still kind of go in and, and customize those how you want. Brilliant. Does anyone have any any questions on on that? If not, then we'll go on to the this final set of exercises. So this is question three of the exercises. Um, and yeah, if you want to kind of hide those deprecation warnings, you can just run this cell. Um, and this question, again, is using that exercise um, example and asking you to create a facet grid with it and then um, hack the axis labels. Additionally, if you get through those exercises, there's an extra extended, more challenging exercise of creating a pair grid and then um, hacking the kind of um, some aspects of that grid. So the axis labels and also the, um, the tick values as well. Um, so that's a bit more involved. Um, but yeah, definitely have a go at question three first. And then if you want an extra challenge, have a go at question four. Um, yeah, I think I'll give maybe 10 minutes to have a go at that exercise and then I'll go through the solutions.
Okay, great. Did anyone have any questions on those exercises before I go through the solutions? Cool. If not, I'll go, um, I'll quickly go through um, the solutions. So in this question, um, yeah, we're using a, it's asked you to use a facet grid of histograms to display the distributions of pulse rates for every combination of diet and exercise type. So we do, first of all, the thing we need to do is create our grid. So to do that, we call facet grid. And again, the data is our exercise data this time. And then we specify the categorical variable that we want to spit over on our rows. And so I guess we can kind of, we, it doesn't specify which to use for rows and columns, but let's put diet on rows. And let's put the kind of exercise is we're going to split over the different kinds of exercise in our columns. Next, we call map to, and now we're going to specify the type of plot that we want to show. And it's asking us to create a facet grid of histograms. So that's going to be sns.histplot. And it's asking us to show distributions of pulse rates, so histograms of the pulse rate. So we're going to pass pulse. Cool. So now we've got a histogram of the pulse rate for every combination of diet and kind of exercise. So in question 3b, it's alerted you to the fact that the X axis labels have no units, which is possibly the worst crime you can commit in visualization. So it's asking you to redo the plot with the unit um, beats per minute displayed on the X axis. Um, so again, we have our plot like before. And then we saw how we can access our figure and AX objects with this G dot figure and G dot axes methods. And we're only going to change the X axis labels on this lower, on these lower panels. So we're going to loop through um, all the column indices. If I am range three, and we're going to change the axis labels for each of those um, columns on the bottom row. Cool. And now um, we've got units on our x-axis, which is brilliant. Okay, great. So does anyone have any any questions on that, that exercise? Cool. If not, then um, we'll leave the workshop there for now. Um, and I'll leave this extra exercise um, as extra practice for you if you kind of want to have a bit more of a look at um, pair grids and Seaborn. I'll just quickly show you now also how to download these materials onto your machine. So we've been working in this training environment, um, but if you want to 
have a go at running Seaborn um, locally. If you go into chapter two, there's this demo download notebook. So if you just click onto that, Um, and yeah, this machine is temporary, so this virtual environment will be shut down tomorrow um, at five o'clock. So just to be aware that if you wanted to kind of have a go at those exercises and stuff while the machine is still up to do it before then. Um, but you can go ahead and run these cells. This will put all the materials on there into a zip folder. And running this second cell creates this downloadable um, button here. Um, so if you just click that, it will um, download the uh, materials onto your machine. Um, if you want to run these locally as well, there's a couple of dependencies and those are outlined in, the, in this GitHub repo. So if you want to run the materials locally, you'll need to install this JR PyViz package and that will install matplotlib, pandas and seaborn for you. Or alternatively, you could just um, install matplotlib, pandas and seaborn as well if you want. Cool. Would you like me to okay. stop the recording now? Is that better? Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Great. So